Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, greetings and peace. Welcome to the Dean Shaw Media, your host, subscribe, hit that notification bell if you haven't already. Now, my next guest grew up in North London. She's the sister-in-law, get this, of the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, who's a buddy to George Bush. Also, daughter of actor Tony Booth. She's worked as a journalist and political writer for the London Evening Standard, the New Statesman, the Mail on Sunday, which is supposed to be the biggest selling Sunday newspaper in the UK. She went from hanging out and appearing on TV shows with celebrities to joining us here on The Dean Show to share her wonderful and amazing story and experiences that's affected so many people who were once or still are affected with the hate book towards Islam. Let's bring our, our next guest, Lauren Booth. Salam alaikum, sister. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, my dear brother. How are you? How is your family? And a big salam alaikum to everybody. Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Peace be with you. And you, brother. So I mentioned Tony. Let's start off with this because this is a tree, probably intriguing to a lot of people. This is the this was the former prime minister to the UK. This is like what we call president of the United States, but president of UK, prime minister. So you're sitting at the table with uh, this your brother-in-law and you tell him look i've accepted islam or how does the conversation go uh, when he finds out so the interesting thing is that actually there had been a, a rift in the family uh, with me in the family about five or six years before because i began to stand um, against the policies of his government and um, i was actually really nervous when i decided to come to Islam because the minute every, everybody was saying, you've got to stay close to your family, you've got to stay close to your family. And I'd been this sort of radical person saying, you know, what they're doing to the poor is wrong. The war in Iraq is wrong and following my heart. And I felt very disloyal at, at times um, telling this truth. But then you read, uh, alhamdulillah, the ayat in the Quran that tells you you have to be true to, to the haq. You have to be true, even if it's against yourself or against members of your tribe, your clan, your family. And so I was greatly relieved by that. So I can't say that there was a dinner table discussion. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, to be fair, the Blairs are people of faith. They have their faith. And uh, certainly my sister Cherie, uh, God bless her, has always defended women's rights to wear hijab and, and defended me in public as well, mashallah. Did you ever get a chance to uh, share Islam with Tony Blair? How much knowledge does he actually have, authentic knowledge of Islam? You know, you know? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave him to himself and say all we do is we pray for, mm -hmm. for any leader. And those leaders who, who, who make money their, their God um, and who commit crimes against humanity are, are, are in danger. And so all we can do is pray for him. Now, I mentioned that he was a friend of George Bush and many people don't, I mean, now the truth is uncovered that the war that happened, and we could just touch upon this, that killed, what was it, conservative numbers are like a million innocent people. It was based on a pretext, a lie that this country had weapons of mass destruction and they went in. Was he part of that? That's the one. So people. Listen, at the end of the day, you and me know, and I'm sure everybody watching this now knows very clearly Subhanallah, if it hadn't been for Britain at the time, America could not have unilaterally committed shock and awe and decimated Iraq. You know, this mockery of Muslims as living in the Middle Ages when America's forays into, uh, you know, the world, across the world and around the world are bombing people literally back into the Middle Ages because they don't have electricity and they don't have clean water. Um, you know, it, it's it's it's. It's hideous. It's a, a shame. It's, uh, it's, you know, huge crimes have been committed. So I don't have any sympathy with that. And, and to, about the war, the war in Iraq, I just say this, Fallujah. If nothing else had happened except for Fallujah, and I'm not going to go into details here because brothers and sisters and people in humanity are brothers and sisters in faith and humanity. Go look up Fallujah. If, you still, if you're still against the war in terror, you still think it had a good basis, forget beyond the money, beyond Halliburton, beyond all of that, Human beings, Fallujah. That's all I'm going to say. I wanted to mention that because before you can go ahead and get public support, usually you have to demonize the other. So nowadays there's a lot of misconceptions, misinformation, and that was perpetuated. A lot of this was to go ahead and to create this 
you know, war and to go ahead and see, you see what happened, you know, but many people, smart people are hopefully waking up, you know, getting educated and like you did. And you actually thought that the Quran, there was a couple of points here. You were so surprised that the Quran, there was a Quran, an English translation of the Quran. And then you thought this was because you were treated so kindly by Muslims that you thought the Quran was a handbook on how to be a good person. Is that true? Yeah, subhanAllah. When I first came across the Quran, it was handed to me. My first ever uh, English copy of the Quran was handed to me by a young shabab, a young man, a young uh, teenage boy in the street, rainy streets of Jerusalem in 2006. And um, he was so excited to give it to me. And uh, he handed it me with or lots of other gifts that I was supposed to pay him for because he was like the person introducing me to the stall holders. And if you ever get the chance to go to Jerusalem, Please go, go and visit the Palestinian people there. Go and visit their city. Go and stay in Palestinian owned hotels. Go and visit the shopkeepers because, you know, if you're Christian right now, and by the grace of Allah, you're watching this, welcome, welcome, with big love in our hearts, welcome. Go and visit the first Christians. Go and visit those who are Christian and converted to Islam. Go and those that visit those whose family would have known the family of Isa alayhi salam, would have known Maryam, would have known their, their extended family because they never moved. Guess what? Allahu Akbar. So you go uh, along into these bazaars and you see everything is covered in dust because people are told not to visit these dangerous Arabs. And so I was handed this Quran and I was supposed to pay for the gifts and the young man said something, and it, by the grace of Allah alone, it changed the course of my life. He said, I said, how much do I owe you? Because I was expecting to have haggle, brother, you know? How, you know, is it 50, 500 shekels? Is it 50? How much is it? And he looked at me and he handed me the Quran. He said, there, you don't owe us anything. You don't owe us anything. But one thing, only one thing I'll ask, please don't forget Palestine when you go. Allahu Akbar. And that's how I got my first ever copy of the Holy Quran, in the streets of Jerusalem, this ancient city. But when I went home, it, it, it sat on a high shelf out of respect for a year. And when I finally picked it up, it was the scariest thing I'd ever read in my life. Because I came at this scripture as a Christian. I was a practicing Christian at the time. I went to church. I believed in God. I knew that Jesus was uh, a prophet. I don't remember ever praying to Jesus. I remember Jesus being... You know, the son of God thing was always a, a bit of a sticking point with me. But but I absolutely believed in God and the prophets. And so I opened this book and I thought this could be the big one. Hmm. Not, you know, not a distant one, not a messed about world. I've got to be prepared that this could be the biggie. So I opened the Quran and I read Surah Fatiha. And I thought, oh, it's called The Opening, and I've just opened it. That's kind of cool. Okay, The Opening. Yeah, they've got something going on here, subhanAllah. I wouldn't have said subhanAllah then. I didn't know it. But then I read Al-Fatiha, which is just a few lines long, and it reminds you of how great is our creator. Worship him alone and ask him alone for support and help, and don't go off the pass. And don't, and, and don't, and don't make him angry with you. And I was like, okay. As a Christian, 100% behind that. And then I went on to Surah Baqarah, and that was like a gut punch. Because Surah Baqarah is, is the, the, the longest uh, Quranic chapter. And it has many, many warnings and rules and regulations and advices. And it tells you, just two pages in, there are those who are the pretending at this faith. But when they're alone with their evil ones, they chit chat and laugh at it. And, you know, they are the ones who are going to the hellfire. And it was like, oh, my God, that's me. I go to church on Sunday. I drink on Monday. I backbite on Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday. And my whole job is backbiting. And I know I'm, I'm in this kind of lost spiritual state. But then on Sunday, I'm like, oh, dear God, forgive me. And this hypocrisy, and it, and it looked right at me and told me that, and then said, "You and God's so angry with you, you're just going to the fire. So what do you do with that, Eddie? What do, what do you, seriously, I, I understand if people are scared by the Quran, but remember this, this incredible, incredible holy scripture, subhanAllah, tells you what you need to know at the time. And well, I needed to know that. 
I was just writing this down, what you said, and I want people to make a uh, a post on this. You said that I was going to church on Sunday. I was back to work on Monday, backbiting uh, on Tuesday. <laughs> you know, drink, <laughs> drinking on Wednesday, drinking, lying drinking. on Thursday. Wow, that's deep. And you, you actually went, you went from being on different uh, celebrity TV shows, hanging around with celebrities, mm. I mean, living a lifestyle that many uh, dream to attain. I mean, having a connection with uh, some of the uh, close to, uh, is there any tie to uh, to Tony Blair and that family with the royal family? Mm, I think that, that may be an American reading of how things work in the UK. Yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what. I, I never met Diana either. I'm sure she okay. was very nice. Because we, th we think, okay, because it, for many people, it's kind of confusing because here we have the president over there, you have the prime minister, which is kind of like yeah. a president, but then you have the queen. Alhamdulillah. So is there, do they, do they, um, they still have some. Do you know what? Because the, qu the queen is sure. the one who gives like overseas things, it gives the blessing, right? <laughs> I can't that believe that we're talking about this. It's fascinating, but it's uh, not my... It, okay, so I, I tell you what, go away and watch the film The Queen with Helen Mirren the Queen with if you want to know how the Prime Minister deals with the Queen and how she deals with him. Okay, because yeah. that really that really sorts it out. Did the ever, Queen can I... So that's did it. people ever connect you with having, like, uh, being part of the royal family when they've heard that you accepted Islam, being connected to Tony Blair? Did some people no. have that? You know, no. you know what, you know what I get uh, being called on the internet. Is she Laura Bush? That's what I. Laura heard. Bush. Okay. Laura Bush. Is she the daughter of George Bush? Yeah. So we can put that to bed. That with that to bed. Never met the Queen. Not the daughter of George Bush. I think we're clear. Okay. <laughs> All right, but definitely you were living a lifestyle that many dream to attain. And now you're part of also writing for many of these uh, conservative uh, political uh, newspapers. And now you're just like, okay, this is the big one. What goes through your mind? You're thinking, hold, hold on, I'm risking a lot here. I could be now labeled, you know, like many people do, extremist or, you know, connected to some radical uh, religion, which people have this misconception and uh, maybe not invited now to many of these social gatherings, blacklisted. What's going through your mind? Where do you get the courage to move forward? Because there's a lot of people, a lot of people in that position that they ascertain that Islam is the truth. But then because of possibly being blacklisted by family, by a political party, et cetera, et cetera, they opt out from accepting it. Here's the thing that when the truth comes to you, your heart has to be ready because it will wipe away everything. So I, you know, it took me five years to get out and Allah knows each of our hearts and our conditions and how much of a, you know, how shaken I had to be in my life. I had to be humbled the year that Islam was gifted to me. I didn't accept this Islam. SubhanAllah, who am I? Who am I? Thank you. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll open it and I'll read. No, Islam lands in your life like, like a rocket. And, and it goes woof in the most, but in the most beautiful way, it's a love bomb. It, it, it is it, it from, from the, from the, the very core of your being. I mean, you know, you just think about it. You know, I was sitting in a, in a mosque, in a far flung place. And suddenly I knew with absolute certainty that there was one God and his name was Allah, that the prophet Muhammad was the last and final messenger that all of the messengers were true, that they all had the same message. Obey God, do good, you know, don't, don't sin. There is a heaven and there's a hell and the books are real. And you sit and I sat there and I was, well, I, I was just, I wasn't scared. I was in a blissful state. That was how it happened to me. I know everybody has their own story. But but Allah takes us on the path that we need to shake to shake and shape us. And I'm a you know, Allah knows my, my character is a sort of experiential. I, I see life as an experience. Um, I used to see it as a kind of win-lose dynamic a bit. But but subhanAllah, now it's what you do with the experience. So when it came to me, wallahi, nothing else mattered. Except that, how do I put myself right now? Because along with that wonderful joy and that absolute certainty that there is calm and peace in the universe. And it's so beautiful. And you see leaves in a new way and you see the rain and you think about the cells in your body. And how can 
what somebody says about you in some dodgy newspaper when you know they're taking cocaine anyway? How can that measure with what you're reading in the Holy Quran? How can their words actually... Why did you say it? Because they're taking cocaine anyway. Yes, you know, you've taken cocaine with them three days before in some wow. dive, divey toilet, and now they're writing their stuff like they're so holy. And wow. you're like, whoa, I was a bilam in a shaitan and regime. That's deep. <laughs> Subhanallah. But this is nothing new to you. I mean, you, you talk about as a child, you were someone who was aware you didn't suppress the fitra. And we know that every child is born upon the... Fitra, meaning the natural inclination to, if you left it, Oxford did a study on this, you know, with children that they concluded that the belief in the creator is just innate. So you didn't suppress that as you were going up. And you also had experiences with your father saying that mm -hmm. there's only one God and Jesus is a messenger or prophet of God. Tell us about that. Subhanallah. My, my dad was an amazing, amazing man and an amazing flawed character. He was larger than life. He told the best stories. He was the greatest storyteller. And he really messed up people's lives. May, may Allah have mercy on him. But he always, uh, you know, supported the poor. And he always used to speak in these ways. He used to say to me, remember, this was the hippie era in the 1970s. I'm a child of the 70s. Yeah. Um, so he'd sit me down and say, listen, it's about changing the world. This isn't it. This, pla this plant, uh, this table, this is not it. There is, there is something that's what we can't see is greater than here. And I look back and I'm thinking, Allahu Akbar, how close was he even in his, you know, state, drunken state, telling me about these things, but he was so close. Um, and my dad had a terrible accident with fire, Allahu Akbar, and um, it changed the course of our lives. But I was a kid who believed in God. And in fact, my mom one day said to me, the family keep asking me, why you've become an extremist mm -hmm. in religion. And I said, okay, mom, what do you tell them? She said that you were always a weird kid. You were always praying. You were always, I'm going to tell God, I'm going to ask God. And that was me, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, until I reached my teenage years. And then, I, then a friend mocked me, you know, why are you putting your hands together? I'm speaking to God. Who's God? Is he the guy in the cloud? And then this kind of, uh, you know, haze of 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 um, confusion, you know, entered my heart. And then you've got your nafs and you've got your ego and you've got temptations as a teenager. And it's a it's a long journey back, isn't it? Life is a long journey back. But you're right, the fitra, subhanAllah, I've spoken to um, children of very secular parents. And um, I like I like my dad taught me. I like to speak to people and to children on a real level. Where do you come from? Where are you going? This isn't it, you know, almost when the parents aren't there. This isn't it. It's something greater. And when we talk about you being great, it's about how much good you can do. Because, you know, and so I asked this, this one uh, child who is uh, seven years old, do you believe in God? And she said, yeah. I said, who's God? The one who takes care of us. And then she said something really amazing. We were walking down the high street and I, and I got greeted by, and remember, her parents are absolutely secular. We want to give her a choice, so we're never going to speak about God, ever. Okay? I'm like, I don't know what choice that is, because if you're given a choice, you speak about God. We're walking down a high street, and some Muslims walk past, and they're obviously Kuwaiti or perhaps Qatari, and they say, I say, Salam alaikum. They say, Wa alaikum salam. How are you? How is your family? And she's looking like this. And she says, do you know them? I said, never met them before in my life. She's like, that's how you speak to strangers? I'm like, in this faith, that's how we speak to strangers. And she gave a two-minute lecture to me. The seven-year-old young person from London, young child, said, you can see light on people's faces. When they're doing good, the light shines through their face. And when they're doing bad, it goes dark. And she said, and the dark isn't to do with skin color, because you can have people with dark skin who are full of light. I've recorded it. That's fitra. Subhanallah. And... Uh, May Allah forgive us when we take that from our young. SubhanAllah. Have you ever, we get excited when we hear about different celebrities uh, accepting Islam because obviously they have a big following and have, have you had a chance because you love, you, you talk about and we see it, you just love talking to everyone mm -hmm. about God, the creator. And uh, have you had a chance to talk to any of these celebrities that you were friends with? Are you still friends with, with any of the people from the past? Mm -hmm. One or two. 
And uh, I think, um, yeah, I think I'm probably really annoying. In fact, there's a one, there's a wonderful uh, TV journalist, and I keep saying to him, you know what? All, all you'll know what you need to say to have the perfect life right now. He's like, what is it? I've testified there is no God but Allah. And the prophet, peace be on him, is the last prophet. And then I don't hear from him for two weeks. He's like, anyway, do you want to do this TV thing? <laughs> and so, yeah, sometimes, but you have to know the person to be that blunt, to be honest. Um, I love to have conversations with strangers um, because there's, there's a kind of purity and a clean slate. And I think that's why it's so difficult for converts to speak to our families and especially our mothers and fathers. It's like, you go into sort of white terror. Mm, like, don't don't talk to me about this. I changed your nappy. You're like, ugh, they shut you down. But when you're with somebody who doesn't know you, you can make a really good first impression and start again. That's how I tend to think. I remember one time, brother, um, being on a plane. And the guy uh, in front of me coming from Qatar, he uh, had a little sweat, a tank top on. He had tattoos. And he was, uh, he was obviously a bit hungover because he was a bit sweaty and beery. And I looked at my uh, passenger ticket and I thought, please don't let me be sitting next to him. Please don't let him. And he said, he, he showed the uh, hostess when he got on, you know, F21. And I looked, F22, it's going to be a long flight. So I got on, nudged past him, and he kind of looked at me like, ugh, Muslims. And I sat down and I just made a little dua to myself, you know, let me be kind to this person and not be too judgmental. And uh, he, he offered me, he started drinking wine, but he gave me his water. And I thought, well, that's nice of him. So I said, do you want my cheese? And he said, sorry, what? I said, do you want my cheese? He said, thank you. And he thought I couldn't speak English. And when he found out I was from Manchester, he's like, oh, that's amazing. And I'm really, really sorry. And I said, why are you sorry? He said, because of all the presumptions I made about you. And so I was just kind to him. You know what I did? How are you? And this big guy on a plane from Qatar to London, he broke down and said, I'm suicidal. And I don't know why I'm alive. And that's all it takes for most people is just a genuine question. How are you doing? How are you doing in here? How's it really going? And he said that sometimes, I said, yeah, I said, I pray to God when I feel like that, I ask the one who created everything, help me, I'm in need and I don't know what I'm doing. He said, no, I don't believe in any of that. I said, but you do something. Everybody does something. What is your protocol? He said, when I'm crying a lot, I look at my mom's picture. She died when I was young and I say, mom, help me. How sad, how painful. And I said to him, as gently as possible, did your mom ever pray? And he said, my mom had a hard life and she used to pray all the time. I said, then why don't you ask the one your mom asked? And long story short or long story long, I had I'd just been given a, a, short, a small copy of the Quran in English. I took it from my bag and he accepted it. And when he got off the plane, he was holding it going, Now, that was a purposeful moment in my life. Allah Akbar. That's, that, that's what it's about. Uh, besides talking about God Almighty, Allah, the Creator, you also like to talk about a subject that many people run far away from, uh, explicitly your father's death. Why do you like talking about your father's death? I think, um, I think for me it was uh, inspiring to get to spend some time with him. We'd been estranged for a number of years. Again, this family argument about, you know, stuff gets in the way, right? But when it came to the end, I got called to his bedside uh, about seven days before he passed. And I thought there is only one reason that Allah has put me at his bedside. It's not to right wrongs. It's not to make him laugh. It's not to, it's because you're a Muslim in that room. And and be real with him. My dad was always real with me, no matter how gritty it was. <laughs> he was he was like, let's cut to the chaste kid. Not in a harsh way, just in a real, you know, let's speak heart to heart, you know. So I saw him and he was sleeping and he was emaciated. He hadn't eaten for five or six days. He was really on the way out and I was stroking his hand and I was reciting Sora Fatiha. 
And he opened his eyes and they were so bright, so bright. And he looked right at me and he hadn't been recognizing people who'd visited him and he hadn't seen me for over two years. And he said my name, Sarah, he said, you are so full of light and you're so honest. Allah Akbar. And he said, go on, sing some more. And he thought that the Quran, he felt that the Quran was singing. Subhanallah. So, subhanAllah, I recited what I knew. I recited the calls. I recited, and then I said, Dad, I'm only here because I'm here to say goodbye. And I'm here to tell you about your Lord because you will be seeing him. You'll be with him soon. He said, will I? Because people don't like to say, you're, you're on your way. I think if I, if I had seven days, if I was, you know, even, you know, if we're in a confused state, don't frighten people, but know them well enough to go, should we talk about this? But you have to have a message to give them, right? I mean, if you don't, if you're a nihilist, if you don't believe in anything, hey, you're going to be worm food in seven days is in two weeks is not a nice conversation to have. I get it. But if you, if you really, really have this, this beautiful certainty then you're able to speak to your family members and you're able to take it in and not be afraid. So we had a conversation about death. And um, I said, listen, I want to speak about God. And he said, stop. And I thought, oh, dear. He said, I want to tell you something. There is no God but God. And Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was not God. And I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good with that. He's like, let's just get that straight. OK, Jesus is not God. I'm like, OK. And then I said, look, we believe that the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He's, he, he was the kindest, most honest, uh, most, most truthful, most, you know, uh, God fearing person who ever lived. And he was the last prophet. And my dad said, all right, then he probably was. All right. He was the last prophet. He's basically, he's basically, I mean, that's the Shahada, like what he said, there's no God but God. There's nothing worthy of worship except the creator of the heavens and the earth. And Jesus is a messenger. That's what you would have said at Jesus' time. Muhammad, yeah. is, peace be upon them all, is the final messenger. So yeah. it seems like he was taking his, like, agreeing and accepting. Yes, this absolutely. Fact, this and what was the last words that I heard my dad say that he said was, we left the room, subhanAllah, never forget the poor. He said it twice, never forget the poor. Those were the last words I heard my dad say, Allah Akbar, in this realm. And the next, and when he when he passed a week later and I got the phone call, I was actually in Istanbul and I had the most beautiful dream that my dad was being um, bathed by four imams in a big white palace. SubhanAllah. This so I've is... never felt sad about that. I feel like inspired. Alhamdulillah. This is, Alhamdulillah. Uh, this is beautiful. Uh, tell us, um, ha have you... Um... You've heard of uh, this uh, guy who you have a kind of a similar accent to. His name is Russell Brand. <laughs> oh, my God. Russell Brand. Yep. Russell is doing a great job, and I really appreciate him. Uh, he veers, you know, off on a tangent with the anything goes, you know, do what you feel kind of stuff. But, boy, right now he's smashing it. And, and I did meet Russell back in the day. I don't know if he remembers. So Hopefully not. Okay, so you've met Russell Brand. There's pictures of him before, like having or reading the Quran. So I wanted to ask you, have you met him? And has he, how much does he know? Have you gotten a chance? Well, you probably not, but do you know people who have talked to him about Islam or since he's there in UK, right? Do you know what? Um, I think he was with Jemima Khan for a couple of years. So uh, who's I, I that? think who's, who's, uh, Jemima Khan was Imran Khan's ex-wife and she would have spoken to him about Islam. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm absolutely certain from from that, you know, that 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 he's aware of it as a world religion. Mm -hmm. the, the big thing for for most people, brother, is the accepting of a faith from God with stipulations. Morality, right and wrong, that at some point you have to say no to yourself. I you know, I, I think, um, you know, there is there is a, there is a great uh thirst for spirituality out there but when it comes to saying and people should not do this and and then there are things that you must not do people run you know the, the nafs kind of fights you so i think we should all pray for him i think he's doing a smashing job of kind of um fighting uh you know the big companies and big pharma and may may allah bring him to the truth i mean 
So, so if you had a chance to sit down with uh, Russell Brand, Lauren Booth, what, what would you tell him? How would you uh, invite him to go ahead and search more for the purpose of life while we're here and to uh, look into the Quran like you did, to really read it and to really connect with the creator? What message would you have for Russell Brand from Lauren Booth? Do you know what I would say? I'd say uh, read. I know you read. So how about reading the Sirah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, by Martin Lings? It's written in a story form and you will know the best of creation and you will be inspired, inspired on whatever journey you're going on. But know about the prophet. Now it's time, inshallah. There's also another experience that was really fascinating. Uh, many people, when you um, talk to some people, they say, well, who created you? you? Say, my mother created you. So you have to correct them. No, she carried you. She didn't create you. But when you, when mothers give birth, you went through that moment where you had to look at the child and you, you, you're honest with yourself that I didn't create this child. Uh, talk to us about that experience, that moment. For me, uh, the first time I gave birth was like a moment I'd waited for my whole life. I hadn't been waiting for it, but when it arrived, it's, it's an amazing thing. And women don't, we don't speak about this enough. So I'm going to get really passionate here. Okay. Especially brothers, you don't know. It's like every cell in your body is alive and tingling and ready. And you know, when the Holy Quran subhanAllah talks about women being on the verge of death, that it is this, this, this great wrenching of the, of the uh, veils of reality. I just felt these veils going, whew, you are close to something now. You're close to creation um, because, because you're, you are, you're bringing something into the world. You didn't create it yourself, but you're bringing it. You're, you're being enabled to bring it into the world and you're going to see something new and you're going to be a part of this. And there's, no getting, and there's no getting away from it. Most things in life now we can negotiate. All right. And unfortunately, you know, sisters, if you, if you ever think about having a cesarean section, as like, I'm going to negotiate with this. I'll have a scissor. Don't do it. Don't deny yourself this incredible experience. Unless, of course, obviously, medically important. Take your advice. Take the advice of your doctors, right? But, but if you can do it naturally, it's incredible. And I screamed. And it was guttural. And it was, ugh, you know. And then when the baby comes and, and I looked. And you see eyes and toenails, and hands. And you know, I didn't think, have brown eyes. I didn't make that hair. I just ate a bit and wobbled along, you know, and did my best. And here you are, and you're perfect. Honestly, birth is amazing. Oh, just let's stick on this for a second. I think it's really important that anybody who is in this situation where they're planning on it or about to have a child, I think everyone should watch this documentary called The Business of Being Born. I don't know if you got a chance to watch that. It's The Business of Being Born. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. I haven't. So this goes into the growing rate of cesarean C-sections in the United States, all over the world, where it's just skyrocketing. It's become a big business. You know, so it goes back to, to what you were saying. And there's this also growing movement now of home births also. And also many people are going towards midwives. Uh, Eddie, can I just jump in here? Yeah. Um, we're not live, are we? Uh, kind of, Oh, yeah. we are live. Oh, we are live. Yeah. I was going to ask to take a pause because it's the Adan. Yeah, go, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. It's just, a, you know. So the Adhan, for people that don't know, this is the Muslim call to prayer. Liam Neeson, when he was in Turkey, uh, he was first annoyed. I always mention this story. Uh, when Liam Neeson was in Turkey, where you're at, he would wake up hearing this, this noise, what he called it at first. He was very annoyed with it. But then he just got accustomed. And then it, he said it was like something penetrating his soul. So Liam Neeson, he went, came back to America and he was sharing this story. He would just uh, seem like he was is glowing in his heart you know attracted to it which uh, the adhan is what muslims hear they call the prayer calling people uh saying that there is uh in english i like translating it god is the greatest god is the greatest there's no god but the but god allah uh muhammad is the messenger the final messenger la ilaha illallah there's nothing worthy of worship but god come to prayer come to prayer come to success come to success and it was it would seem like he was so close to accepting islam he got a big pushback, which many people 
end up doing. So I don't know uh, what happened from there from our Irish oh, so friend, that would be Liam Neeson. I, yeah, Liam Neeson, I, I suspect that he watches your videos, inshallah, and that he's doing his own digging. And there is nothing wrong. I, I meet secret Muslims all the time. Subhanallah, and it's the most amazing experience. I kind of really, really, they're really precious. Though those experiences, people have different views on it, but we don't all have to be out there. If you're watching this, and you have taken your shahada and you're keeping it um, to yourself for a while for safety reasons, maybe go ahead and do that. But remember as well, Subhanallah, that if Allah has given you this great gift um, to be the person that others can come to. For, for real spiritual advice, to know our faith, to do the work of the faith is, 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 is a part of the duty. So don't, don't miss that opportunity. But I've met, um, I went to a, a, a meeting of a sheikh in London and um, the, these were, these, these were, were the Sufis, I think it's a friend of mine. And um, there was a lady there and she had a little skirt on to her knees. She was about 70 years old and a little kind of beret and I said, hello, how are you? She said, assalamu alaikum, I think. And I said, oh, walaikum salam. I said, are you Muslim? She said, of course, I've been Muslim 23 years. Family still doesn't know, but Allah knows. And it's like, and you know, I used to go shopping uh, in, in uh, Manchester. And sometimes these, I remember this uh, kind of really rough and rugged girl in a, in a, in a kind of jogging suit um, came up to me. And the, my daughter sort of went, oh, here we go. And I thought, all right ready myself and she said salam alaikum and I said walaikum salam she said have a nice day and I said and you and it was like okay <laughs> so you know alhamdulillah and uh this is uh so what you, what you did we couldn't hear it but that you took a break you wanted to this was uh the edan and I was touching upon the uh Liam Neeson incident and just um you're actually in Turkey. So you get to hear the Adhan regularly. Now, how was it when you went to also Bosnia? Did, were you able to hear the Adhan oh. when you when you were when you were there? Yeah, it's kind of it's a bit quiet in Sarajevo, though. Do they turn it down? Oh. Uh, you know, it's a, yeah, it's not kind of as raw as as as, as a ripping. Um, yeah. as it is here i did but, i did um, a pro i did a program on that like turn it up or turn you, it down because you can uh, uh yeah so some people mm -hmm. uh, were complaining why it was turned down but uh uh yeah so we're, we were trying to get it back up but you got you kind of got to hear it right of course and how was your how, how was your experience in bosnia what, one of the most pivotal experiences of my life um you know for me and my my daughter alex we went together we went for two weeks and we th and we made the intention we're going to pay our respects to the Muslims there. Um, because if you don't know, you really should know that there was a genocide uh, in the 1990s. Um, and it was you know, appalling war crimes visited upon the Muslims in that region. And really, uh, we should you should find out about it. So I won't I, I don't think I could. Sorry. I can't do it justice here, but um, it's it's a, it's an appalling part of European history that's kind of skirted over. But we wanted to meet as well the Muslims there today, because who knew that there's Muslim Europe? And now maybe you're watching somewhere in the world and you're going, that's not true. It's Judeo-Christian. Uh, mm, you know what? Almost a quarter and one time a third of Europe were majority Muslims. And uh, what's fascinating about Bosnia, brother, you well know, is that there are churches and then mosques and then a little road uh, between them and then a church and then a mosque. Because although Islam was there for 800 years and is still there, the churches remained. Mm, what does that mean? Oh, does that mean the Christians are allowed to pray? Oh, yeah. Does that mean they lived side by side? Oh, yeah. And Croatia. And then, you know, this, this, this awful hatred uh, rose up. But... For me, you know, it's best described as Minarets in the Mountains, which is a wonderful book by Tariq Hussein, Brother Tariq Hussein, who's written um, about the Balkans, which is Kosovo, which is Macedonia, uh, you know, which is Bosnia, which is Albania. And for me, I, I, I spent a long time years ago in Austria, and I thought that's probably the most beautiful place in the world. You know, to be honest, it probably is. But when I went to Bosnia, I thought, goodbye, Austria. Goodbye racists who don't like Islam. I'm not coming back to your country. Nice people too. And very beautiful. But I now have Bosnia. And so I want to go twice a year. Inshallah. Ya Rabbu Alameen.
You like it that much, huh? Yeah. It's a be beautiful country. Second home. It's like, Listen, yeah. I'm looking for I'm looking for a house there. Make no mistake. Second, well, you know, it's like home. I I feel like I'm in a portrait somewhere. Like it's just so beautiful and serene. Did you yeah. get a chance to visit the uh, memorial site, the museum that they made there outside of Srebrenica? Please uh, go to my YouTube channel, um, Lauren Booth. You just put it in and um, go and look at my visit to Srebrenica, mm. to the memorial there. You know, it, it's one of the most horrific places. And it's, uh, I met a man there um, whose family, you go into the, um, the, the graveyard and there were hundreds and hundreds with the same name, hundreds and hundreds with the same name. He's like, they're all my family. Subhanallah. And yet he managed for with his Islam to to come through it on the other end, to 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 still be a creative person, to still have a family, to still work for his people. And this is the resilience that faith gives, subhanallah. Yeah, there was uh when you see all the different writings on the wall, one of them that stood out, it was uh, UN and they translate United Nothing because they were supposed to be protecting those innocent men, women, and children. But then they ended up, the Dutch ended up leaving, throwing a party, and there was... Hang that, on, they didn't that, just leave. You know, you're being too nice, Eddie. I know you're there in America, but you're being too nice. They disarmed the Muslims. Mm. They demanded that every man, and they all had their own little old rifles, okay? They weren't heavily armed, but they were hunters because they live in the mountains. And they came house to house, bang, 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 bang. And they searched the Muslim houses and they took the weapons. And when the Serb, um, you know, Serbian uh, genocidal army came through and the Muslims were saying, please, they're coming. Then we know what they're going to do. Please give us. Oh, we can't. We need this piece of paper. And they left them to be massacred. That's what happened. Point of history. Yeah. And many people don't know that was the greatest genocide after World War Two. And uh, you had and this is a, the other thing. It just a. Because a lot of times we're told uh, as Muslims, you know, we're, we're put under the radar if some lunatic does something and they try to, you know, just defame the whole religion of almost two billion people. But you never hear about these Chetniks. You never hear of this movement there that was actually connected to the New Zealand killer uh, terrorist, uh, Andrew Breverick. They, he was actually playing these Chetnik song. And this is a whole ideology that wants to exterminate uh, Muslims there. So Do you know what? There was, there was a study, sorry, but there was a study done. Um, it's over on um, Blogging Theology. He's doing some great stuff, mashallah. But he did a video about um, which are the, which the most murderous ideologies. And num the, the, the ideology that has killed the most through, through the last uh, three, four thousand years is Christianity, I'm sorry to say. And then after that, it's atheism. Okay, you look at Marxism, you look at communism. Right. You you look at um, the Viet, um, the Viet, not the Viet Cong, but. Um, oh, gosh. Um, anyway, the, you know, the communists, basically, in all of these areas, the millions and millions of people that were killed and the atheists and the, and the wars over oil. And then after that, I think it's number six or seven is Islam. So so at the top, Christianity, 120, 178 million atheism, 125 million um, Islam, I think 23 million. And one death is too many. Okay, one innocent, innocent death. Make no mistake, this is not a, a win, a win lose thing. We don't want anybody on this list. We want no more wars. We mm. want no more massacres. We want no more children dying under drones. Mm -hmm. uh, we we don't. We want no more women in Sarajevo having to walk side by side and know that the rapist of their mother or themselves is still free and wearing a t-shirt saying "Finish the job." Wow. Yeah, and then when you look at, and were you surprised, you see the Christian churches, like they're still standing after the war. You had hundreds of hundreds of mosques just obliter obliterated, but this goes back to the teachings of Islam, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and this is why you had all those churches uh, left, you know, in their place, and this goes against the narrative a lot of times. So it's good, you know, people visit and they get to see, you know, this is like a modern day, they say European Jer Jerusalem, they call it there That's right. in Bosnia where you have mm. Jews, Muslims, please, and living please, together in, in peace. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Just, just visit there. You're right. The Jerusalem of Europe yeah. is, is, uh, is, is Bosnia. It really is amazing, amazing, mashallah. The, you know, did you see that line? They literally have a line where east meets west, and you walk through Bas Chashia. Did you walk through there, the little shops? You feel yes, like, yes, yeah. that's right. Yes, we did. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we had a photo there. Oh, it's just sensational, subhanAllah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't get a chance to go this year with all this madness, but I, I, I miss Bosnia. I hope, I hope mm. to, to visit soon. It's an amazing, amazing country. I think for identity purposes, me and my daughter being uh, converts from um, Britain, we felt really at home there. And we felt like, oh, okay, for once we're not aliens. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not aliens in, uh, you know, in the Muslim community who sees us as weird and we get asked, are you Muslim? Mm -hmm. No, I wear this for fun because I like being shouted at in the street. <laughs> You know, I really, you have to stop yourself from being sarcastic. Yeah, no, I, I just put this on every Tuesday for a bit of a laugh with my friends. Yes, I'm Muslim. And then, um, you know, of course, you know, other people uh, saying stuff to you. But alhamdulillah, it, it's, I, we wouldn't change it for anything. I saw you did visit that masjid up in the mountains there. That was very moving. The, um, uh, the It's called the War Mosque. Mm -hmm. And it was where the brothers used to pray when there were Serb forces in the hills and they were fighting for their lives, and their city, Sarajevo, was under siege for a, a number of years. The people were on the brink of starvation, Allahu Akbar, and, um, and they had this beautiful little mosque, and I had the honor of going there. And with the brigades, with the surviving brigades, and um, I tell you, I hope you can maybe later on, if we edit this, cut in some of the scenes that I saw there because it was so moving. And they were so kind and so sweet. Listen, Muslims are sweet. When I wasn't Muslim and I used to go to Muslim events, I felt so, I felt like a big giant bully who had no, uh, you know, no, no emotional compass amongst a, a little a little playground of very sweet children who are about four years you know I was like 14 and they were four in their innocence in their sweetness and I still feel that way today Allahu Akbar and you know if you have a good Muslim friend you know you're probably experiencing that too like why are you so nice why are you giving everybody at work food why why are you looking after my mother when i'm out when my own family won't do it why would you run me to the airport you know when my best friend says she's busy it's the teachings of the holy quran and our prophet muhammad peace be upon us who make us the good people in society you should want more islam not less yes absolutely and just to touch upon one more thing before i go into my next question is that you have serbians you know, this is a nationality, you know, and a lot of times because of this nationalism, which the last of the Muslims yeah. of the mankind, Prophet Muhammad said, this stinks, you know, this is going to be a division between people because you do have Croatians, you have Serbians who have come to Islam. They have searched out the purpose of life. They found that the Quran is indeed from the creator of the heavens and the earth based on evidence and proof. And they've accepted and they've been welcomed open heartedly. And those who ha haven't, that's, we still live in peace. But now just as people ask Muslims to condemn you know, such fringe elements out there, you do have amongst in that in that community, you have some who are extreme that now some Serbs talk against that, you know, so it's not labeling a whole a whole nation or a nationality because Islam is about living peacefully with your neighbor, no matter if he's Jew, Christian wow. or whatever the case. So this is very you important. Know. And it goes back to uh, knowing your deen and sharing your deen, which you love to do, which we've kind of, and I think, because I went to visit a Chetnik uh, uh, in his church, he's a priest, when I went there. You know, there's the there's a line of division between the Republic of S Serbia, and it's interesting, when you're driving, you can just go from one part, the Federation of Bosnia, and then you cross a line, and you're in a different part. So it's kind of scary, you're going, I went here at his church service, and I went there, and I talked to him. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see that. You can see it on our Facebook page. I just reposted it. And he had no idea of many of the teachings of Islam. He didn't know that we love Jesus. Uh, there's a whole chapter named after his blessed mother, no, a mother. So we also are doing a very bad job at conveying mm. the message of Islam. And I think many of our problems come from us not doing what our creator, God Almighty Allah, told us to do. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's kind of a tough one because um, on the one hand, we're sort of trained to take faith out of the public space and that it's almost like a dirty thing to talk about. It's either dirty or embarrassing. Uh, you know, don't, don't talk about it over dinner. We don't, so you don't talk about politics and you don't talk about religion and just keep it out in the space. Well, when are we going to talk about it? Uh, when, when is that magical space going to happen if it's not in our daily lives? So the more that we 
push those conversations away, the more um, misinterpretations mm -hmm. and disunity arises. I'm really glad you said that about about Serbia and Croatia, and because these are nationalities, they don't have to be ideologies in the individual. It doesn't have to be like that. And so, you know, we we pray for each and every person, and we want individual. Um, relationships, but we we also pray that these ideologies end and that those spreading hatred are are are, are sidelined by their by their own communities. And mm -hmm. um, because just as Muslims, we are, we are called upon to sideline those who are calling uh, who may be misguided and leading to um, violence and misunderstanding. Well, we call on on you, mm -hmm. on your community. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody is speaking to you violently and saying, God, those Muslims, they stink. I wish I'll go rape their women. Or why don't you go and do this? Or my, my very good close friend of mine, she had her hijab ripped off a couple of days ago in Leicester. She's traumatized. The police did not come and, came and questioned her husband and not the people who did it. These are real things that really shake people. Well, so what are you doing in your community, dear viewer? What are you doing to stop the hatred when you hear it? Tell us more about this. What happened now? Was this in the news? Was this something that uh, was just an isolated incident that happened in your neighborhood now or with your friend? Was this something? Why did this happen? So she's a practicing Muslim woman with she's hijab. She's a practicing Muslim. And, she's a convert. And, alhamdulillah. And, and someone just off the street randomly came and just No, they'd been her? sold. They'd been so, so there'd been some bullying by this gang of about five adults. Uh, they live in the same building and they've been shoulder barging and, you know, making comments was it go back to Iran? I think they were saying to her some random, you know, it's normally Saudi Arabia. I don't know why Iran came up. But anyway, they'd obviously read something on the Internet that day. And um, so they've been bullying them and other Muslims in the block for a while. And uh, this particular day, it tipped over and um, they, they, they pulled her hijab off. And she was actually on the ground looking for it outside her home. And her husband went after them on his own, which is dangerous. And there was a scuffle. And then they called the police. They ran away laughing. They called the police and the police questioned him and said, did you start the fight? Did you do this? And now they're so, they're so upset by their interactions with the police, they don't feel that they can report it. So we're still working on this, inshallah. And um, when, you know, sister's ready, uh, when she's ready, inshallah, she will, she will. But this is, it's a fight, brother. It's a fight because you're upset. You don't feel the police are on your side. And then you've got to get the guts to go in and see them again and be bullied by the state. Mm. And that's, that's really difficult. Is this like a group like Tony Robinson, like the EDL or something, or these are some local thugs? or Just local thugs mm -hmm. for a bit of fun, a bit of a laugh. So the police, I mean, they're still there. She has to still see these people, and there, yeah. have, there haven't been any consequences? They haven't Nothing. been charged with any... Not even crime. a knock on their door. Not Nothing. even a knock on the door. Has there been no. public outcry, some public pressure from that? She, We've got, we've got um, a group called MEND, and we're in touch with them, uh, Muslim engagement. Um, and we're going to uh, be speaking to them, inshallah, about this. Hopefully uh, this can get out and there could be some more public uh, pressure. Isn't the uh, the mayor there uh, Muslim? In London. Yeah, in yeah. London. Saudi, Saudi but the, this is where? Where is this at? Leicester. This, this is, is Leicester. In the Midlands. So it's a couple of hundred. It's about 150 miles, um, maybe 125 miles away. Uh -huh. Yeah, is but this is, but the, here's, the, here's the issue, brother. This is normal for Muslim women. It's like, oh, you get spat at, spat at never mind. It's, oh, become, you it's, becoming, it's becoming more normal in the UK. It's, it's getting worse yeah. rather than better. It is what it is. I've left. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, make no mistake, I left. I left because I'm afraid that that society is falling apart. And I wish I wish it well. My daughters are there. My friends are there. Uh, my, my family, extended family are there. But for me as a Muslim, I felt it, I could... It, and it's not just about faith. It's not even just about ethics. It's about the, the commercial material society. When you take away people's material goods, and that's what's happening now in the UK, that's what happened post-COVID, people fall apart and it becomes really kind of dangerous. And that, um, yeah, Allah, Allah took me from that. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So we got about five minutes left. Let's, okay. talk, let's talk about, so you made hijrah and you see a lot of people who are actually uh, leaving and coming over to places like you're at Turkey. I think we have to be really careful with the term hijrah. 
for somewhere like Turkey because Hijra is looking for an ideal Islamic state and that's not fair. Turkey is a uh, a dynamic and mixed place to live and mm -hmm. it's pretty much 50% secular uh, with other with other um, religions here and still 50% inshallah of people who are practicing the faith. So I, I don't think you can put it as Hijra. Mm -hmm. Did I come to somewhere by the grace of Allah um, where, where the Adhan is called? Yes. Where there are beautiful mosques? Yes. Where you, we can do charity, um, you can do that in the UK, of course, you can do that in your own environment, but where there's a peacefulness in, in wearing the scarf, yes. Mm -hmm. So are you, are you seeing, how, how is life there compared to where you left the UK? How is it for your dean? How is it like, we just got to experience you just stopping and hearing the edan, so I mean, that's, that's something you amazing. You know what, sometimes you just don't want to be the other. Sometimes you just want to be yourself. Sometimes you just you just don't look at me in my hijab. I want the hijab on to be invisible when I'm out. And that's it's like a cloak of invisibility. And it's lovely when it works in the West and you're invisible. And as a woman, you're not stared at. Your comments aren't made at you. That's that's when it is working beautifully. And then when it when it draws attacks, that's when it's uh, something we have to to wear with uh with with steadfastness there's a big change right because several years ago there was also something there with the hijab right in public places and now it's also changed for the better oh gosh in turkey well listen yeah. 20 years ago president erdogan had to send his daughters to america to study in the hijab allahu mm -hmm. akbar because you could not have the hijab in Turkey. So again, that's another topic for another day because it's huge. There was communism and there was secularism and it was deliberately entered into the Muslim lands of Europe and this confusion reigned for a while and this hatred and fear of what had gone before and this forgetfulness. And now, alhamdulillah, um, some stability, inshallah, mm -hmm. we pray for that. Uh, let's let's talk, talk about real quickly this 10-year itch, you know, you know, where we are now and the importance of continuing to get well grounded in the Dean. And mm -hmm. then we'll go on to uh, our, my last question. Well, th well, this, yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to speak, especially to people who are uh, perhaps converted, you know, it, it's so important to keep on learning this faith. So it's so deep, Eddie. It's like you dive in to this wonderful ocean and then it's like you're almost drowning because it's like, I don't know anything and I'm a sinner. And, and it seems so overwhelming and the, the waves are washing over you. If you've ever, I've tried to surf and it's like having this big, <laughs> you have, you're getting dragged underneath the waves and, <gasps> and you know, you forget about the beauty because you're kind of overwhelmed. That, that can be an experience, but that only happens continually. And then of course the pull back, where are my friends? Where's my fun? Um, and, and the, you know, shaitan and the temptations, you know, everybody's still going to the bar. What about Christmas? It looks so bright and tinselly and you forget about people being bankrupt in January. You forget about the arguments over who gave the biggest present. You forget about the drunkenness and, and the fights that go. You forget because it's all tinselly. Oh, let the sleigh bells ding a ding. We'd love it to be like that. But it's not Christian. It's nothing to do with Christianity. And it, and it is not peaceful. But all of these things for the convert and for the born Muslim are their reality. So I keep just inviting myself to go back to the beginning, go back to the basics. I'm now, by the grace of Allah, learning Arabic. I am doing the hard work. 11 years in, you know, fala, fala, falu, falat, falata, uh, trying to get the Arabic grammar. Why? My aim is to read the Quran with understanding before I die. Ya Rab. And I've studied a couple of books this year in depth um, because the explanation, dear brothers and sisters, is you start working on yourself. You start really understanding your, your, you know, what your flaws are in a deep way and the deepnesses and how do I please Allah when I get rid of those? What am I meant to be doing? It's not just about undoing, it's about redoing and uh, for the pleasure of God. So please, if you're feeling confused, if you're feeling lost, uh, come find me on Instagram. Uh, I love to recommend books. Um, keep watching uh, the Dean show, inshallah ta'ala, and keep learning your Dean and keep going back. Don't just make it a part of life. Oh, I do my five prayers, or maybe I do three prayers. That's probably enough. You're gonna, that's an easy way to slide away and you won't get the beauty. 
I want to just touch upon real quick. We've got one minute left. You uh, have a new book, and I'm really impressed that you've made it. And I think we're lacking here the audio portion of the book. You actually have a book, but it's also in an audio book format. And I encourage others, because if you ever go to Audible and you just put in Islam, you have a lot of the hate propaganda that's pushed through these audio books. So we really need to ca catch up to get the right information out there. And Audible audiobooks is a great resource that we're lacking tremendously behind. And you are actually promoting your book as an audiobook, correct? Alhamdulillah. It's called In Search of a Holy Land. And it is the these stories. Um, it, it's my own journey, but it's the stories of Muslims. It's the story of Palestine. It's the story of us being from birth to death and all of those experiences in between. How do they impact us and how should we react? And what does Islam actually mean in our lives? So I've recorded it myself. There's a lot of laughter in there. Um, I'm, that's the character Allah Ta'ala has given me. There's a lot of light and shade. And uh, people have said that they cry and they laugh in equal measure and uh, that, that their heart is, is warmed um, by the truths there, inshallah. So in search of a holy land, you can find it on Audible. You can find it on scribble.com. And it's, I kept it really, really super cheap. Um, sometimes these things are $18. $18. I've made it $1, $2, because I want as many people as possible to have access for it, inshallah. Wow. Thank you very much for sharing some of the highlights of your story and some great experiences there that we got to benefit from, some advice. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. May Allah, Allah bless you. keep you close to him. Ameen. Ameen. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmat. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So what an amazing story, amazing journey. And this is another proof upon proof. When someone is sincere and they are searching to want to know what is the purpose of life, why are they here? And like she did, she got to experience the kindness of Muslims. She thought that the Quran was a handbook on how to be a good person. So coming from a family of Tony Blair, you know, to being with celebrities and living that life to coming to peace, purpose, contentment. What do you got to lose by reading the Quran, which she thought was a handbook on how to be a good person that spreads and tells us to go ahead and have a direct connection with the creator of the heavens and the earth, believing in one and only one God, believing in Jesus, a whole chapter named after his blessed mother, Mary. There's so much to go on. I can go on and continue, continue, but read the Quran and continue to tune into the Dean Show. We'll see you next time here. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell. Until next.